Hey there and welcome. Today we're going to be talking about a sensor that's getting quite a bit more common in installations uh, lately and this is the back pressure sensor uh, or an EMAP sensor which which really stands for exhaust manifold absolute pressure sensor. Um, we're quickly just going to go over why they're being used and why they can be quite handy and more importantly proper installation. Quite often when these show up um, they're not mounted in an ideal way or connected in an ideal way so we're just going to go over why it's important to do it correctly and uh, and just some easy ways to to do it. All right so what are these things used for anyway? The most common and traditional use of a back pressure sensor is simply to gauge or measure the effectiveness of your exhaust system and to ascertain whether it's flowing enough for your purposes. Any sort of back pressure is, is basically resistance to flow, so it's a good tuning tool for you to see um, where you need to go in terms of exhaust flow. Another issue was in kind of in the same regard as if you mounted it before the turbo, you're measuring the back pressure and we would take this back pressure reading before the turbo and compare it to the boost pressure that the engine was seeing. And a, a kind of an old school rule of thumb was once your back pressure was twice as high as your boost pressure, you knew that your turbine section was just running out of flow or flow capacity. And you could see significant volumetric efficiency drops if you try to raise boost any higher. Basically, your, your engine's just working really hard to pump that exhaust out. So it's still a good metric today and we still use it for that. A more recent and sort of clever use for manifold, exhaust manifold absolute pressure sensors is some ECUs can actually use that EMAP to MAP ratio in the fueling calculation to correct for um, or more accurately model the volumetric efficiency of that engine. So it's actually used inside of a fuel equation or load equation in the ECU and in that case you really want, you don't want just a gauge pressure sensor. You want the full exhaust manifold absolute pressure sensor. The difference between a gauge pressure sensor and absolute pressure sensor is gauge pressure is reference to your current atmospheric conditions. So whether you're at sea level, that on your gauge would be zero and any positive pressure above that would be boost or positive pressure, right? If you're in Denver, let's say you're like 5,200 feet, that would be zero in terms of gauge pressure and anything above that would be positive pressure or boost. An absolute pressure sensor is reference to perfect vacuum. Basically, think of that as outer space. So it's a constant reference. It doesn't change based on where you are on Earth. It's always referenced to perfect vacuum. So anything above perfect vacuum is a positive pressure and it's it's a more, oh, how should I put it? It's a consistent pressure reading. So in these sensor, in these cases, that's what you need. The third use that's not as common, and I'm surprised how many people don't know about it, is to correct your wideband reading. Widebands are designed to work over a very narrow pressure range. And once you start putting it into a system with back pressure, their readings will no longer be accurate. So with back pressure, if you're in the rich region of the sensor, it will read richer than it is and this effect can be quite pronounced. So I've seen some pretty, you know, obvious examples where I will tune a car and I'll know that there's seven pounds of back pressure where that wideband is mounted. So I'll leave it deliberately rich. So let's say at 11.2, that 11.2 is not 11.2. That is actually approximately 11.8. It depends on the brand of the sensor and whatnot, but they're all affected by pressure. So let's say you didn't know any better and you saw 11.2 and you would say, well, geez, you know, that's really rich. 
I'd like to lean it out to 11.8. Well, guess what? You're already at 11.8 in actuality. So if you lean it out more than that, you're going probably too lean for what you're trying to do. So that's one important thing. A lot of ECUs these days, again, have that built in and they will correct it based on the back pressure for you. If not, if you're on the dyno or whatnot, you should be aware of what uh, what's happening. And both Bosch and NTK, the two common tuning kind of widebands, uh, have that specification available and a little formula to correct it for the back pressure. All right, so the number one thing that kills these sensors is heat and vibration. So given the nature of what you're trying to measure, which is exhaust gas, which is very hot, we're talking 16, 1800 degrees plus, depending on the application, you definitely do not want to direct mount these sensors to an exhaust manifold. And you might say, yeah, yeah, that's obvious. But you know what? I've seen cars come in and, and that was like that. So I had to point that out. So keep in mind that the temperature rating for most of these sensors, both for the uh, the fluid or whatever they're measuring and the environmental, you check your data sheet, most often that I see is 125 Celsius. So keep that in mind when you're mounting them. The other thing is vibration. So remote mounting these is always the best kind of solution. You can kind of put it on the fender with a P-clamp or some people even make like a billet mount and you screw a fitting in it that looks fancy. So you can do like a simple P-clamp setup like this with just, you know, bolted somewhere to the inside fender. Some people make fancier ones with uh, like a little billet block that you bolt and then you can screw a bunch of sensors on. Doesn't matter as long as it's remote mounted somewhere away from heat and where it's isolated from vibration. Now, given that you want to isolate it from exhaust heat, you're, and you're typical if you do like a silicone hose or like even a braided hose, they don't have near the temperature rating that you're gonna need. So I don't really use these anymore, but uh, this is, and sorry that it's messy, it's old. This is an uh, auto meter number. It comes with a length of one eighth copper line to install like boost pressure, uh, oil pressure gauges and whatnot. And it comes with a selection of like compression fittings. So what I did here, I just, I wrapped it around a socket just so it looks kind of neat, whatever, and you do something like that, orient it, whatnot. And then you would use, it comes with a little compression fitting and a little ferrule. So these just mount very easily. So these are quite easy. You would use like a little, uh, the tube nut, Put the little ferrule on and then you see it's got a little flare in there and as you screw it on you're going to deform this ferrule to see uh, seat against the, uh, the tubing and make it airtight so that's one way to do it and then whatever fitting you adapt that to whatever you're you're uh you're working on um I don't, like I said, I don't use this tubing anymore. It's quite, a, like this kit's about $20. I mean, it's not expensive, but, and once you've crimped this ferrule on and you try to reuse this a couple times, it can really squash the inside diameter of the pipe and start to have problems. So it, it'll work and it's convenient because it comes with everything and it, you can form this really easy by hand, but I don't, I don't really use that. I've, I've been using either so I've been using either stainless steel brake tubing, which I've got a piece here, right? And you can bend this up the same way, except this stuff is really hard to bend by hand and to do a neat job of it. Like it's, it's quite stiff. Stainless is nice because it'll last forever. You could polish it up, looks good. Um, and uh, yeah, but uh, it's, it's hard to work with at least I, I don't like it. I mean, it would be okay if you had a long length to run. So you just use your tube bending tool from, you know, brakes or whatnot. You can bend it to where you're going. But uh, I, I've discovered this stuff. This is a, this whole spool is like, I don't know, 30 bucks or something. And this is 3 16 brake line. 
but it's copper nickel alloy. And it's super easy to bend, just similar to the copper. You just bend it by hand. And it's, so it's nice that way. You can quite easily form it into a, into a, into a little coil if you want. So actually I, I 3D printed this little, little guide to make that easier. So let's basically do it by hand or I can clamp it in the vise. And then we just kind of start wrapping, right? And then it'd be easier if it was in a vise, but I'm in front of my camera here. So, All right, and you just keep going. Not too bad. I keep hitting the tripod. <laughs> All right, so something like that, just a quick dirty, and then unscrew my form. Right, I mean, that's not bad, it looks pretty neat. Uh, for these, there's no compression fitting. So for these, you don't use the same side of, uh, style of ferrule compression fitting. Like the stainless line, you kind of got to use a this style of uh, ferrule that's... I don't even know what this is called. You need to use this, this kind of nut. So for these, you don't use the compression type ferrule. You have to actually flare these. So you put the little nut on, slide on. This has your flare in it, like this, right? And then you need to use a compression tool to flare this. So you could use just an ancient, like cheap, this is a, like an old Summit flare tool and you've seen these. Keep in mind that AN, keep in mind that AN fittings are 37 degree. So a 45 degree kind of flare tool that you get at Home Depot won't necessarily work with high pressure and stainless line because the stainless line is very stiff to, to flare, but it'll be good enough for this, but this is the right one. Oops, wrong way. So make sure you slide the, the nut on first like this. And then you would clamp your flare tool on, give it a little flare at the end, and then that'll seal up against the three uh, AN adapter and I keep so I just keep a few of these kind of common ones around to make my life easier right so if you've got got one eighth NPT and you need three don't screw aluminum into exhaust <laughs> especially pre turbo like it'll melt eventually the melting point of aluminum is quite low you, you really want a steel one and you know something like that so yeah and then once you've got that coil, I would still adapt this to a piece of pre-made uh, stainless steel line. I like the pre-made stuff because it's pretty cheap. Goodridge makes this. It comes in uh, lengths that are like two inch increments. Comes with like one end as a 90. And you just, you know, flare, cut this tubing where you need, put it on fitting, and then you can adapt it to this line and run the, run the sensor anywhere you want.